Good morning. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It is April 22nd and it is Earth Day. And just, I reserve the right as chair to make a comment that the health and welfare of people is directly correlated and connected to the health and welfare of our planet. And I remember the beginning of Earth Day when I gave my first talk and I hope that some of you also remember that and the significance of celebrating our, the healthy planet that we should have. So we're working here to bring things together. And I know that as we look at some bills, perhaps uh, coming up, we will be again linking our environment with our public health. So thank you all for being here today. We are going to begin by looking at H210. And we have some folks here to help us uh, improve the bill, give comments on the bill. Um, so uh, we have a draft up on our webpage and I know that Katie has been, our ledge council has been working hard on the bill. She'll be here with us a little bit later, but right now we'll just, we'll begin and hear testimony. And again, committee, I think, our rules, uh, end of end of session rules. We want to listen, and uh, sort of restrict our comments and our questions as much as we can. We did such a good job yesterday. <laughs> Very proud of you all and me. So uh, let's let's go right ahead. Then um, Hillary Wolfley is here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record, and we'll listen to your testimony. Good morning. Uh, my name is Hillary Wolfley. I'm the Associate Director of the Vermont Program for Quality in Healthcare, and I'm very happy to be joined by our Executive Director, who will be delivering the testimony, Kathy Fulton. Um, she, we were unsure, just I'll let Kathy, <laughs> but uh, as to who would be showing up. So we're very happy to be joining you this morning, and I'm going to pass it off to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Can everyone hear me? Oh, yes, good. we can. Yep. Oh, good. Um, good morning, Chair Lyons and um, members of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, Vermont Program for Quality in Healthcare is submitting this testimony requesting the committee's consideration re related to the following section of Draft Bill H210, um, Section 252D6. And VPQHC would like to ensure consistent funding is provided to support efforts to improve the equitable delivery of care across the continuum of healthcare services here in Vermont. Most immediately, um, and in partnership with Dr. Maria Mercedes Avila, VPQHC began offering a baseline health equity training series for healthcare providers and professionals called structural competence and cu cultural humility to address disparities and inequities. In January of 2021, VPQHC received funding to coordinate three of the baseline trainings for healthcare providers, also including mental health providers. And within just a few weeks of posting the trainings on our website, all available training dates had been filled beyond capacity and our wait list grew to over 80 interested participants. VPQHC was able to secure funding to coordinate an additional eight baseline trainings, but we anticipate that these training sessions will fill quickly as well. And to date, two of the baseline trainings have been completed. The training series has received excellent feedback from participants uh, with all participants indicating that as a result of the training, they are able to demonstrate increased self-awareness of racial, ethnic, and class biases. Um, additionally, all participants reported that as a result of their participation in the training, they will be able to incorporate structural competence and cultural humility into the services they provide. VPQHC is looking to expand this training series to meet this demand and offer at no cost to the participant an additional series of baseline and advanced health equity trainings over the course of the next year. 
We are anxious to identify additional funding as soon as possible as there is willingness and readiness among the community of healthcare providers and professionals to start this journey now. VPQHC believes that health equity, health equity and equitable healthcare is quality healthcare. Equity is included as one of the six domains for quality that was identified by the Institute of Medicine from its quality chasm series back starting in 1999. And um, our testimony has um, a table that outlines those domains of quality. So we very much appreciate the committee's attention and dedication to advancing this essential and much needed work here in Vermont. And um, that's, that's our testimony here uh, this morning, Chair Lyons. And I believe I just saw a message that Nellie has it posted on um, your website. And we have additional details and information on health equity available on the VPQHC website as well. Uh, thank you so much. And I understand the work that you're doing. I do have a, a quick question that might inform any changes we make to the bill. And that is the work that you're doing seems uh, or could be consistent with CEUs through the Department of Health and others. Yeah. And so I'm, uh, my question is, are you coordinating with the, the OPR or Department of Health in the administration of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, I believe the mechanics is uh, that we go through uh, the AHEC up at UVM, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but we're absolutely, and um, for quality professionals, uh, we right directly at VPQHC can submit to the National Association for Healthcare Quality for CEUs as well. Okay. And we are, um, the Department of Health is overseeing our contract for this work currently. So they're, okay. yeah. Okay out all of the you know pre and post test findings to them and you know what's coming up and who's attended so all right thank you very helpful thank you very much you're very okay. welcome um and we're just going to move right along we greatly appreciate the time and uh effort that you put into your testimony and so we're going to uh continue along and hear from um i don't see mark hughes here we're going to move along to uh, Wichy R2 uh, here from Wyndham County. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we welcome your testimony. Sure. So I'm here on behalf of the Brattleboro Area BIPOC Health Justice Committee. Um, and we also uh, submitted a written testimony. Uh, another hat that I wear that I'm not technically representing here, but it is going to be relevant to my testimonies. I'm the second vice president at the uh, Wyndham County branch of the NAACP. Um, and I thank you for being here. And if it's okay, I want to start my testimony. Please do. Yeah. Great. So um, I want to talk about this sort of from the work that we did uh, that was done with the BIPOC vaccine clinics in Southern Vermont, which I helped um, architect the model for. Um, and we were able to vaccinate um, over 1,100 people um, that were 80, 80 to 85% of whom were BIPOC, um, about 95% were in a household with BIPOC. Um, and the reason why we were so successful were for several reasons. One, we were able to collaborate um, in just in Wyndham County alone with over 36 organizations that do community work, whether with the homeless or people who are identify as LGBTQ+. We basically were able to work with a lot of community partners. We, we were able to fund um, people to actually have calls and to help schedule uh, people for this, uh, for the clinics. And um, to note, one of the more important uh, collaborations was with the Department of Health, especially the Health Equity and Community Engagement Team and our directors of public health for our counties. Um, and uh, other, success, uh, other reasons why we were successful is because we were able to have the one-to-one -one, um, sort of 
conversations with our community members and being able to identify what are the things that are that are preventing you or creating a barrier for you to getting this vaccine. And among them, we saw transportation be a really big one, not understanding the, the effects of the vaccine or being able to understand that they were free, uh, being being not able to be to register for it because whether they did not they didn't know how to fill out a form they didn't speak the language um, they didn't know where to go there were so many links it was confusing um, and we were and on top of all that we were able to provide a lot of different resources um, for them uh, whether they be links to people to call for people to call we were partnered up with UVM to create education sessions so we were basically on the ground doing this work and the reason why we were able to do this is because we had money we had partners and we had the backing of the Department of Health. And when I look at this bill, I see this model and the success of the model that we've had with the BIPOC clinics being able to be backed by a state strategy. And I'm excited that this bill went to the Senate, but I worry that right now the, the, it says that the Office of Health Equity will be created when financially able to or when fiscally possible, some, something like that. And that worries me because that means there's no real, it doesn't seem to me that there's real accountability of when this Office of Health Equity will be. And we need, we need some type of state strategy and we need it soon because that, those of us on the ground, we know, we know what needs to happen. We are with the people. We know the things that we need to solve and it's not just in healthcare, it ranges so many different types of aspects and we need to be able to have those conversations. Um, and we need money to have those conversations. Uh, so that's a, a basically the end of my testimony, just hoping that there's accountability around funding for collaborative partnerships and uh, some type of timeline of when this Office of Health Equity is supposed to start. Uh, thank you, good, uh, very, very well said and uh, good points that you've made. Um, I will allow one short question, Senator. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, I just, uh, Wichi, thank you so much for your testimony. And if you're able to stay on, there is a new draft that includes a couple amendments that speak directly to your concerns, um, including a date certain by which the office needs to be included and some more fun, uh, money, uh, more language about funding. So um, stay tuned I, and happy to answer more questions after we get to the draft. Excellent. Thank you so much, Senator. Okay. Right. We're, we're all looking forward to our new draft, but it's important for us to hear a confirmation of any of the changes that we're making. So your, your comments are very well taken. Um, let's move on uh, to Joanne Crawford of the Abnaki agent, agent, sorry, nation. Joanne is not here yet. Yeah, I'm right. Oh, here, here, here. here. Oh. <laughs> I, I can't stand Zoom. <laughs> we need to be in our committee room and you need to be walking up and sitting down in the chair in front of us so we can have a, a discussion. So thank you for being here. Um, we look forward to your testimony. Yes, thank, thank you for inviting me here uh, today to provide testimony. And I am par providing testimony today as an individual. Um, I. I am uh, uh, Mrs. Koy Abnaki, and I wanted to um, just bring up a couple of uh, items regarding the language and content of the bill. Mm -hmm. And the first is on uh, page two, section 4A. The down towards the bottom of the section of section A, um, there are some races lumped together in a group called Other. And I think that is inappropriate for this type of bill because this bill uh, is striving to make everybody visible and everybody in it and be inclusive. And I, and, I, and I think using other races is kind of counter to that purpose. May I ask you how you might improve that language? I would actually list the races, I mean, Everybody um, deserves a voice. Okay. The bill like this. Page two. Section four A. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And also, um, there's some amazing information in here and statistics provided on many groups, but there is a lack of health and social statistics um, for the Native American community. And I think adding that information is only going to strengthen this bill. And also, uh, if when the commission is you know uh, created, is also going to be a great starting point for them in providing some um, base information to work with. So I would love. I really would like to see um, more of the Native American information included. Is there any way that you can help us access some of that data? At this point, we're looking to pass this bill out, um, if possible, by tomorrow. Oh, wow. Um, I can check with, I would have to go through the Vermont Department of Health for sure. information, and I can see what they can try to pull together um, by the end of the day tomorrow. Is that? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work together on that. We'll see what we can uh, add in at this point. Um, it, we're this is crunch time for the legislature, but I, your, your comments are, again, um, would help improve the bill. So we'll see what we can do. I don't need to put this burden on you. Oh. It's our job. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that, that is all I had. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Well, thank you. Terrific. All right. Uh, and we're now going to continue, get my agenda back. Um, why don't we just go we'll go to Kristen Murphy and then I do see that Mark Hughes is here. So we'll, we'll go, uh, so Mark, if you are hearing me, you'll be after uh, Kristen. So Kristen, welcome. Is it, or Susan, are you speaking on behalf of the organization, Susan Aronoff? Uh no, Madam Chair, Kirsten Murphy will be joining. However, I told her that she was seven of seven and she has something else. So I would suggest just uh, starting with Mark Hughes and um, I will email her right away and let her know that she's up. Terrific, thank you, perfect. Uh, Mark, are you here? Oh, Kristen is in the waiting room, so we'll... Uh, uh, Mark, are you, are, would you like to go now or there? Why, there you are, we'll move ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair. Welcome. Good morning, me. My name is Mark Hughes. I am the Executive Director of the Racial Justice Alliance and uh, Justice for All, C3 and C4. Are you here? Can you hear um, me okay? Oh, hang on a second, Those, that was a, Someone was unmuted. Okay. Please, please go ahead. No problem. And I um, would um, like to first of all, thank the committee uh, for allowing um, me to appear before the committee, the Racial Justice Foundation, uh, which is doing business as the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, the mission is to secure sustainable power and to ensure agency, um, provide security uh, for black descendants of enslaved folks and uh, while embracing their history and preserving their culture. Um, our current major priorities are eliminating historically oppressive and exploitative obstacles and existing disparities in wealth uh, and in home ownership and wellness, <clears throat> providing uh, targeted protection and economic relief uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, instituting and maintaining a programmatic and a sustained approach uh, to support uh, cultural empowerment um, for, uh, for Black descendants of uh, enslaved folks. Um, within our organization, um, there is um, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, some of that stuff is outreach and education. Uh, some of it is, has to do with cultural empowerment. And then there's also community engagement and support. A lot of programming going on. Uh, one is also initiatives uh, and pl platforms and initiatives, which brings me here. Um, we are the creators of uh, H210. Uh, we came into a house and um, introduced uh, H210 with a group of us. Uh, I think some of our board of directors and others, probably about five of us. <clears throat> In H210's current state, we cannot support it. 
Um, it's a little background as well. Um, one of the things that we're also doing at the same time that we're doing this work is, is something that we call a wellness working group um, that's established to manage a program to ensure uh, that black and brown folks are, uh, that they are enabled the ability to live daily, uh, enjoy their highest levels of mental wellness. Uh, our work uh, involves creating and managing uh, what we refer to as disruptive initiatives. Um, these are non-clinical clinical strategies that, uh, that we are able to leverage in the lives of folks, such as peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer networking, uh, such as um, uh, affinity work, uh, affinity groups, um, and various other strategies. Uh, there's also a long-range strategy that we're working on uh, for Black-led alternative approaches to creating healthy wellness and outcomes. Um, we too are a uh, we initiated the statewide BIPOC vaccination program. Uh, here uh, in Burlington, uh, that is ongoing, and I believe there's been upwards of uh, maybe somewhere around nearly 2,000 people vaccinated here uh, in uh, Chittenden County. So we too, um, instead of uh, going back and repeating what um, which he was saying, we have similar relationships to include contract uh, with the uh, with the health department. Um, we're also um, working with um, the, the Chittenden County um, Health Emergency Group. Uh, it was us in Chittenden County that put forward the uh, health as emergency, uh, public health emergency. Madam Chair, I, you're, in, you're in Chittenden County, so you, you see a lot of stuff that's going on here. So uh, also um, in that work, um, there has been a lot of progress in collaborating a lot of organizations uh, around the health as a health um, racism as a public health emergency, excuse me, emergency emergency here. Um, there's there's also a lot of collaboration uh, that uh, we're doing um, with various agencies here in Chittenden County uh, on uh, on health and wellness work, uh, not the least of which is um, you know relationships with the. Region, uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning and uh, North um, uh, various other organizations. So, um, yeah, I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about the policy. Um, you know, clearly the work here. Um, I just one of the side notes I forgot to mention is the work here um, also led to you know through the racial equity, inclusion, and belonging work where we. Um, in addition to working to establish the racial equity executive director at the statewide level, we also were able to establish a racial equity, inclusion, and belonging director here. And then recently, there was also a health equity, um, a, a health equity manager that has been hired for the city as well. Um, so when we put forward um, uh, H2H210, uh, um, we also put forward um, JRH6 which is the, the state uh, joint resolution of the state declaring racism as a public health emergency as well. And I think that's currently in a uh, house general of you know, uh, human services, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken. Happy Earth Day. Uh, I want to um, certainly acknowledge that because without that, um, I don't, none of this conversation is worth having. Um, we've got to uh, acknowledge Earth Day today, so I want to do that. Um, as far as H210 is concerned, um, we were not happy, we were not pleased with the, um, with what came out of committee in house. It was, it was unacceptable. Um, and transparently, you know, I had a direct conversation with the chair uh, as well as um, our representative who um, um, brought the policy, who introduced the policy. Um, and um, we expressed uh, emphatically our discontentment with the uh, outcome of the policy uh, in the, um, the house. The reason why uh, was is because um, a few things. Uh, the as it was introduced, the, the policy sought to establish 
an Office of Health Equity in the Department of Health uh, to advise. That is to say, again, the policy established an Office of Health Equity in the Department of Health uh, to advise the Commissioner of Health and Governor in the General Assembly on the matters of health equity affecting Vermonters. Um, it also established the Health Equity Advisory Commission to provide the Office of Health Equity with recommendations and guidance, as well as awarded grants uh, for the promotion of health equity. And um, it provided a provision for data collection to better understand health disparities in Vermont, uh, as well as uh, requiring additional, um, an additional two hours uh, for continuing uh, medical education on cultural competency uh, in the practice of medicine. <clears throat> Uh, the bill received widespread, widespread support, uh, huge support. Um, we, this is the best bill that we feel we put forward and it is the only bill that crossed over. We also put forward a bill uh, on uh, home and land ownership. Um, we supported a bill on home and land ownership. We put forward a bill on economic equity. Um, so there's a number of policies that we put forward and I won't go through all of the details, but this is the one uh, that crossed over. And this is the one that we were most proud of. And this is the one that we thought was most important. And this is the bill that we feel is most urgent uh, in light of the fact that yes, um, right now um, as a nation uh, due to COVID-19 laying bare all of the inequities that exist across all of the determinants, housing and education, employment, Yes, health services access, but economic development, home and land ownership, for example, even the so-called criminal justice system, there's um, so many disparities that converge upon the wellness of people and specifically first and worst black and brown people in our nation. This is a national health emergency. Now is a time to act. Um, so we are very concerned that this policy was moved somewhat to the back burner, so to speak, and there has been a delay now that this policy effect, uh, effectively represents. And I apologize because I did not see your latest iteration of the policy until just as I was getting on the call. So I, I can't really speak authoritatively about the very, very latest iteration, but it happens all of the time. So it's, it's, not, it's not that you know, not that pressing. I think we can reconcile that easily. <clears throat> so, um, so this this is a, this is a big deal. This policy is a really big deal to the Racial Justice Alliance and in, in, in our constituents. Uh, as far as you know, what we're seeing here is is that you know, as passed by the House, clearly there is no Office of Health Equity uh, being created here. Uh, uh, Vermont needs someone. Um, in leadership who is experienced in the area of health equity uh, to address health inequities uh, and to prevent, for example, situations that were created by Vermont's vaccination rollout uh, in other types of situations, for example, like the testing um, you know, debacle that happened here in, um, in it. And Madam Chair, imagine being on Riverside Avenue and, and Winooski's there and the old North End's there. So this is a pretty hot spot. Um, this is my neighborhood. Um, so this is not just, you know, you know, I think my chief constituent is me, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so I, I can really, I don't just relate to the people that we represent. I am the people uh, that we represent. Um, so this is near, very, very near and dear uh, to me personally. Um, under the original plan, Vermont prioritized people in uh, nursing homes, uh, age 75 and over nationally 78% of people who reside in nursing homes are white. Uh, so we have problems with these policies and it just goes on and on and I can go deeper into that. I'm gonna skip that and go into the next. Madam Chair, go ahead. I was just gonna say uh, in the interest of time, if you could really zero in on the, your comments on the bill itself, um, mm -hmm. your suggestions for improvement and you have already, and uh, um, we hear you. Um, um, please go right ahead, but try to 
but to I'll do specific. my best. I'm, and okay. I should be accustomed to this because usually when it's super duper important to us, um, then time is at, of the essence. <laughs> so I'll do my best to get get there. Unfortunately, if you can expand the day for us, we'd be more, more than happy for that. Well, I already did. I woke up at four. Um, okay. So here, here's what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll just try to pick up the pace a little bit and get through um, get through some things. I did want to give a shout out to um, Senator Cummings, though, because she for so long represented me in, in Washington County. So hi. Um, as the other piece of these, the other pieces that I, I was concerned about was is, um, that we're concerned about here is, is that um, as passed, it tasked the advisory commission with the work that's already been um, that's already been completed by um, by us in terms of how we presented um, H two ten. All of that, um, the advisory commission that stuff was already in there. Uh, it also implies that it's you know when it's fiscal fiscally practicable mm -hmm. uh, to create an office of health equity, and that's this is really where I'll dive into the bill. Um, uh, and it also, you know, again, just another expansion of the executive director of racial equities um, responsibilities too, which is, um, you know, it is what it is. I, I don't know how much more we can put on her plate, but I won't speak for that. Um, the bill itself I have here, and um, I want to start with that last comment is, is in, you know, when the bill came out of, of committee, it was amended five times and, and even the, the funding on it was stricken at the end of the day. Um, I don't think the appropriations felt it was worthy even to be funded. Um, there's, there's a, um, I think those are all of the areas that we are concerned about. Uh, I think the hugest area that, that we believe could uh, benefit this bill if we move back into the bill, the creation of the office that's in the original language. Um, the original bill that we submitted, the, the original language we submitted from cover to cover, we stand on today, even after all of the deliver deliberations. Um, and it does create, and quite well, I might add, an office of racial equity. Um, the reason why I wanted to flag the idea about when fiscal fiscally when they're, when they're fiscally, if I can say that, able to create that um, that office with you know a you know two to three billion dollars coming into the state and the health department now in line for another twenty million dollars, which is almost inevitable with this latest grant that they're applying for. Um, if we are not able to complete to create this office now, if we're not able to create it now. And if this our obstacle is money, then we will never create this office, Madam Chair. So um, it, if there are other reasons why we are not creating this office now, um, I would love to be a part of those deliberations and, and help that conversation move forward. But if we're talking about money right now, this is really a ridiculous conversation given the gravity of the situation that we're working with here. So I think that is the, the largest challenge that we have. I just want to step through the policy real quick. Um, again, um, as we're, I don't have the version of policy that you have, so I'm going to have to ask for just a little bit of leniency here. Um, but there is a language on, I'm going to call it out as uh, section C1 under powers and duties. Clearly we're challenged with the fact that the powers and duties from the original policy was stricken, but I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, we, we would prefer the original language on policies and duties, but the inserted language, which was amendment two over in the house is problematic as well. Um, provide guidance on the development of the Office of Health Equity. This is uh, point one, I apologize, this is point one of um, that section. Um, you can just acknowledge if you're with me, please. Okay, it says provide guidance on the development of the Office of Health Equity, which shall be established based on the advisory commission's recommendations as soon as fiscally practicable. Um, again, it's not just so much that it's a mon money that it's an issue, it's also time that's an issue, Madam Chair. 
because what we're talking about is, is a time to be determined. There is not a date specific that we're, not only are we not establishing this office, but we're not establishing a date specific time to, to establish an office of this level of importance. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm, you're, you're now running over. So what I would like is uh, go through your list. Um, and as you know, we are gonna be looking at a new draft today. We haven't seen it yet either. So we're all, but we do have ideas about what's in there because we've asked for a date certain on the equity office. So let, let's hear- There's 2023. Yeah, let's hear your uh, let's hear your um, thoughts, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm right right now. What I'm doing, uh, Madam Chair, and I can I don't I haven't had the time to pull all of this together, but I I did get up pretty early to review all of these policies, except for the one that I didn't see this morning. So I'm doing the best I can right now to provide you the the, the input. Um, so I, I'd ask as as the creators of this policy that you provide just a little leaning scene. To allow me to I am. I am, a, Mark. Another, Go another right part. ahead. Thank we you. We want to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so yeah, so the, the 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 whole part down here about you know in, in section um, in section F, uh, set, uh, item F of section one, you know, <laughs> this this entire section, by the way, was the eleventh hour amendment in the house uh, from from the whole item one, including all items A, B, C, D, E, and F. This is all a, an attempt of the house to try to um, correct this policy before it got out of the door. They failed, okay, the, this, this entire section, but it's, it's even problematic uh, down to um, item, item um, F where it says um, the time frame and necessary steps to establish the office. Again, we're talking about time frames, advice to make recommendations to the Office of Health Equity once established, including input on, and there's rules. So there's a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, I read too far, but there's a lot of problems with uh, this entire section uh, and, it, and it, it speaks to the point I was making. Uh, there's, we talked a little bit about the grant section uh, that that was taken out. I'm just gonna go ahead and close up because I get the sense that, um, I think you get the point if you were able to look at the original policy, I really do think you you hear me and I think you're listening to me. I don't wanna belabor it too much, but I don't wanna make the mistake of getting off the call uh, without um, you know, covering at least you know, most of what it is I came to tell you, okay? Um, so again, in, with amendment four in, in section and in, in item F under uh, meetings, uh, there's another amendment where there's a lot that was uh, stricken in terms of the quorum um, and the, um, the the meetings, there we we had a a, a public quorum um, uh, component there where it would be required that a certain member number of members of the folks uh, from the public would be there, and that is in item uh, F. Uh, it would have been what was stricken out of two and three. Um, also. Um, you know, there's there's more there on, a, on the amendment four on the second page in two and three where there was an advisory commission, um, some language there uh, talking about um, the selection of the chair that was inserted. Um, just the, it, the the entire policy, you know, is is problematic because it it does not accomplish what it is that we sought out to accomplish. Now it it doesn't, you know, uh, provide the grants. It doesn't provide the commission. It does not provide a time frame when the commission is going to actually be established. It doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't provide the, the authority uh, that that was requested. So problematic throughout. Um, and I would just conclude, um, you know, by just saying that again, uh, Madam Chair, what we did was is the original state of this policy that we introduced in the house. Um, just to say once again, you know, we stand on it. Uh, we think that this is the best policy that we produced this year. We think it's the most urgent policy. Uh, we do not feel that the policy that came over from the house um, accomplishes what it is that we sought out to accomplish. 
We do not believe that the policy, and I just reviewed the policy that's dated today, that's up on your website that came back from Ledge Council. We do not believe that it achieves what it is that we sought out to achieve. We cannot support this policy in its existing form. Uh, this policy, it, it is absurd to suggest that somehow or another that we're talking about this thing not being fiscal, fiscally viable uh, at a time such as this. And it's ridiculous to somehow imagine creating a department as important as, as this uh, on a timeline that is not even date specific. At a minimum, what we could do is, is you know, here on the, I think the most important part of, of probably any policy is, is maybe that very last page where it says effective date. And the, at least what we can do is, is make sure that we call out the fact that this department is, uh, and if we're not ready to pull a trigger on it, then adjust the effective date. But in this current state, um, I urge this committee to stop this policy right where it is or else correct it so we can move it forward so it can achieve the very important work that we sought out to get done. Okay. I appreciate your time and I thank you so much for the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, thank you very much. And if you do, if you have, if there are more hours in your day, which there are not, but there I are can, never I are. I, it would be helpful to have um, some uh, short comments that we can add to our the testimony from you. That would be very helpful. And, Absolutely, Madam and, Chair. And I do want to make one comment about all the money that's coming into the state. And one of the things that is hard for us to realize, as it is for everyone, that that is one time money. And we, what we want to ensure is that when we establish uh, very soon, when we establish the Office of Equity in our government, that it has funding going forward and it isn't one-time funding. We want to make sure it doesn't fall apart. So <clears throat> that, that's the challenge with the money. And I, I, I know it's hard for all of us to appreciate that. It's hard for, for those of us sitting in this committee to appreciate that because we'd like to be probably a little more aggressive sometimes on a lot of things, but so. Again, Madam Chair, I do appreciate having the opportunity to come by and testify. Um, and, um, and, and I appreciate, uh, you know, the, the explanation, certainly uh, definitely heard a lot of that from the governor too. So um, at, at some point or another, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, as we're determining our priorities and as we're um, being fiscally responsible and also, um, you know, trying to figure out how to make these very difficult things come together, um, from our perspective, as as a as a African American man who lives on Riverside in Burlington, uh, <laughs> I would just say uh, that our sense of urgency uh, kind of supersedes that philosophy uh, that you just put down. And <laughs> we'll, that... we'll we'll do what we can do. <laughs> I, so, I'm, I, hopefully, I'm, we can meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, thank <laughs> you for your time, Madam Chair. We're working on it, Mark. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take Appreciate care. You. Yeah, be good. You too. All right. So um, we also have with us today um, a Kristen Murphy. You are here, I think. Yes, I am here, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. And I know that um, our, you have Max. Uh, I would like to be joined by Max Barrows. I'm hoping he's in the waiting room or. He's here. He's here. Excellent. He's Wonderful. Here. So, so you, you just go ahead and then you can introduce Max when you're. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. Max is going to be kind of sandwiched in the middle of my testimony. So. Okay. Um, for the record, my name is Kirsten Murphy, and I'm the executive director for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And just for quick context, because you do have some new committee members, um, DD councils are a creature of federal law. They exist in every state and territory in the country. We're charged with ensuring that people who have a developmental disability and their family members have a voice in creating the policies that impact their services and therefore their lives. And we use that voice to protect the rights that people with disabilities have to make their own choices. And we advocate for supports that enable people with disabilities to live independently um, as contributing members fully included in their communities. So to be clear, we receive no state funding. We are federally funded and I have kind of unique permissions 
uh, to speak on behalf of the council, but certainly obviously not on behalf of the Agency of Human Services, even though I am a state employee. I always like to be clear about that. Um, I want to say from the start, something I said when I testified in the House Healthcare Committee, that I, I truly believe this is one of the most important pieces of legislation, um, if not the most important piece of legislation that I will have the honor of testifying about in my fairly long career in disability rights. Um, and, and the reason harkens back to a, a, a quotation I often use from Dr. Martin Luther King, which is this, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Uh, if we can't get this right, <laughs> there's something very fundamentally wrong. I'm sorry to hear that um, there are, are folks in the BIPOC community who, who understandably, uh, you know, would like would like to see things move faster. I I've been spent enough time in government to understand that that patience is often <laughs> is often something that that's needed, but. Um, Overall, I would say that we really, um, the disability community is, is very happy to join with the LGBTQIA community and the BIPOC community because what we share, the three groups, is that the uh, inequities in health are rooted in historical injustices and prejudice. Um, and um, of course, no one group is more worthy than the other, but I am glad to see disability brought into this conversation because it is often left out and because disability will impact one in five Americans. So we are by far the largest health disparity group in the nation. Um, and that of course has health, uh, not only health and, and sort of welfare implications, but cost implications for our healthcare system too. Um, because our role is to um, encourage the voice of people with disabilities, I would like to have my colleague Max Barrows to say a few, a few things about his experiences in healthcare. I don't think you need a lot of convincing that these are important issues, but I, I think it's helpful to hear from Max, our Outreach Director of Green Mountain Self Advocates. So I will let Max go ahead and, and take a few minutes if he will. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for this. Um, I'm Max Barrows. I am the Outreach Director for Green Mountain Self-Advocates. I am a person with a disability. I am on the autism spectrum. Uh, we support H210. Um, here are just a few of the barriers people with disabilities face ex accessing healthcare. Uh, number one, we often have a hard time understanding information. All of the big words used in the medical field do not make it easy for us to follow along. And often the information is just shared verbally. I need instructions written down in plain language. Number two, we need more training for healthcare providers on communicating with people with disabilities. When they find out that I am autistic, uh, they often make assumptions about what I can and cannot do. This influences what kind of questions or information they give me. It is well worth the time to directly involve people with disabilities in making decisions about our health when we are supported to be in control of decisions about our lives, we get better results. We are healthier. Number three, it is difficult for us to use programs designed by public health departments because most are not for people with disabilities or accessible for people with disabilities. They're not accessible for people with disabilities. Most of them are not. And especially for people with intellectual disabilities. And number four, um, now I want to share a quote from Chris, a person with an intellectual disability. He gets psychiatric meds from a doctor because he does not have access to a therapist. He said, quote, 
when I show my emotions or tell people how I feel, I often just get more meds, end quote. Mm. The problem is there are not enough therapists with experience working with people with intellectual disabilities. This is something experienced across the state. And in closing, uh, speaking as a black man who is autistic, I wanna thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for listening. And thank you for taking action to eliminate health disparities. And please, I encourage you strongly to keep uh, this in mind when you move forward with your work or the work that has to be done. Thank you so much, Max. Um, appreciate your comments. Um, I'm gonna just pick up where Max left off, briefly establish the council's history with this issue and then move to a recommendation. So um, roughly 10 years ago, I noticed emerging research findings um, suggesting that the health status of people with disabilities was much worse than what one might have even kind of um, intuited from general observation. Poverty, lack of access to transportation and recreation, poor diet, um, the common use of medications to control behavior, um, all combined to um, make it pretty clear that obesity poor oral health, even diabetes were, were high. But up until that point, this was not well studied, mm -hmm. um, really, not by public, I have a background in public health, not by public health people. Um, the question I had was lifestyle alone enough to explain why people with disabilities experience, say, cancer rates that are twice that of the general population. That, that did not seem likely to me. Nothing about having an intellectual disability um, by itself organically explains why heart disease, for example, is, is, is much higher for people with developmental disabilities. Um, at that time, I was just moving to Vermont and beginning my work at the council here. I had come from the New Hampshire's DD Council. Um, and Vermont had a large federal grant. You'll remember the SIM grant, the Systems Innovation Model Grant. So the council applied and received some money to do a qualitative study uh, in, in collaboration with Green Mountain Self Advocates to look at the experiences of Vermonters with developmental disabilities when they were encountering the healthcare system. And we got some really rich, um, it was you know, qualitative information from people's stories. Um, and the reports that came out from people suggested that the root causes of these marked health disparities among people with disabilities were indeed complex. They included, as Max said, a lack of provider education, virtually all training about developmental disability and disability in general still takes place in medical education in the context of pediatric medicine, even though most people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live well into adulthood. And adult doctors, including Dr. Levine, who was probably didn't know someday he would be commissioner, Livy, um, expressed to us uh, their desire to serve people with IDD, but also their frank discomfort because they did not have a lot of information and training in how to interact appropriately. Um, we heard a lot of stories about lack of access to care. And here I would note again, Max touched on health information that is almost never presented in cognitively accessible way, appointment times that are far too short for somebody who has communication challenges. Um, the fact that, that frankly referrals and screenings that should be routine at certain ages for people are much lower for people with disabilities like mammograms and colonoscopies. Um, and we also heard, we heard shocking stories, frankly, about lack of physical access. So including um, stories about uh, wheelchair users who routinely came to clinics and found no wheelchair accessible scale or high-low table. Uh, people in, 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 in rural Vermont, but resort towns, well-funded towns, who in fact used a veterinarian because it was the only available place to weigh their son. Um, their son had never actually been examined outside of his chair 
um, unless he was all the way at, in Burlington at our major tertiary care hospital. Um, you know, the unacceptable level of care. Um, really at the root though, uh, appeared to be ableism, right? So let's think for a minute about the lack of referrals for things like colonoscopies. It's not uncommon for a physician or nurse to think that the more humane course would be to skip, say, doing a pap smear for someone um, who might need extra time uh, and teaching to understand what's happening. Um, Self-advocates often reported to us that they are not asked about adult health issues like sexual health, and the providers frequently communicated with parents and staff rather than directly with the adult. Um, so with these findings in mind, we took our paper, shared it with the Department of Health, and the Department of Health was able to receive a CDC grant. I mean, I'd like to think our paper was some help in that. I'm certainly not the only, only reason, but um, a five-year CDC grant to do a deeper dive into the uh, data and to um, do some work on making their public health systems more accessible to people with disabilities. They're coming to the end of that grant. They've done wonderful work. Um, I highly recommend their August 2018 paper, which has many, many statistics that I think are all embedded in this bill, many of them, so I don't need to really rehearse those here for you. Um, I wanna just move to a, a few recommendations about the bill, which of which we are obviously very supportive. Um, Number one, I would just say you got some testimony earlier this week about the need to change the language around defining BIPOC populations, um, not, not defining people in terms of not being white. So I, I think that needs to be cleaned up, certainly. And the, the need for a date certain is also very, very important. And I, I understand you're working on that. Madam Chair, I never come to a committee and ask for something for the DD Council. That is, I don't think in my career I've ever done that, and today I am going to make that ask. I do believe, because of our longstanding history with this issue, that we need a seat on the advisory committee. Um, almost always I prefer to a seat go to a self-advocacy group. I think those are that's very important too. But I do think that in this instance, the Council has something very important to bring to the table. So I would recommend adding, adding language that simply puts on the list the executive director of the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council or a designee. I would probably exercise the ability to be that person. Um, I, there's a second reason for that. And that is that, that we have a, a special agreement, a set of assurances that the Agency of Human Services signs every five years in order to receive the federal money that supports DD councils. And in those assurances, again, this isn't really binding on the legislature, but it is on, on, on the Agency of Health and Human Services, um, AHS promises that the council will participate quote, in the planning, design or redesign, and monitoring of state quality assurance systems that affect individuals with developmental disabilities. And I believe that having a seat on this advisory committee, commission, whatever, whatever it's called, it helps to fulfill that responsibility. And we stand ready to do that and to provide our, our federally funded staff time to, to be strong participants in that process. Um, and with that, I will give you back, <laughs> I, I will yield time now back to the committee. <laughs> uh, uh, Christian, thank you again. You, uh, you're, you're always very clear and bring us um, sound data. So I, I really appreciate this. And Max, thank you for being here with us and sharing your, your thoughts. Um, obviously, together, you've done a great deal of work for the disabled community in our state, and we, we really appreciate it. Um, and, and I'm very familiar with the Green Mountain Self Advocates and I hear from various folks on a, not on a daily basis, but at least once or twice a week and have uh, communication with them and you have really helped them express themselves uh, very well. I appreciate the, your work. I also have uh, a daughter who works with in, the, in this area and has worked in this area and so understands greatly what's going on. So yeah. appreciate it. Thank you so much, Senator, appreciate yeah. it. All right, so um, let's, um, 
we'll move on. Uh, Kaya Morris is here, so welcome. Are you here? Ma she is you, here. Good. Thank you. Good welcome back to the legislature in the time of Zoom. <laughs> In a time of Zoom, it is something very unique, absolutely. Um, so I appreciate you um, welcoming me to the space today and being able to have an opportunity to speak about this bill. So um, for the record, my name is Kaya Morris, and I am the Movement Politics Director for Rights and Democracy Vermont. I do want to clarify, I am here representing rights and democracy, while I also sit um, as a co-chair of the Just Transitions um, subcommittee of the Climate Council and as a commissioner with the Vermont Commission on Women. But today's test, so my testimony is informed by the work that I do in all those spaces. However, I'm speaking on behalf of rights and democracy today. Um, so I, I had to do a little bit of a quick um, update on the latest draft of the bill. Um, I looked at both the original um, as passed by the, as introduced in the House and then as passed by the House. Oh, can you, uh, Kaya, I'm getting some strange noise. Is that you or is, I don't see any other people unmuted, but as you're turning pages, I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it is I, I, seriously, I don't. So it it is the pages, your pages are close to your mic. Yeah. And so when you move the paper, your mic is we're garbled. Getting a, yeah, we're getting sure. a thunderstorm. So just, <laughs> just absolutely. Just so so I, I okay. do apologize. Um, while I am very much in support of climate goals, I often need paper copies of things um, as a means it's for okay. me processing <laughs> and my own brain processing. So I can't just use the screen at this point. So um, in looking at um, the current version of the bill, there's definitely some updates that I think that are very important. It is without question, um, if for those who are not familiar, Rights and Democracy is a bi-state organization um, supporting the needs. Our, our real goal, we look at ways and um, institutions instituting policies and procedures and mechanisms to take folks that are on the margins of the seats of decision-making power to bring them into the center of those seats of power um, and of determining the um, actions that our states will take, our communities, our municipalities will take that directly impact their very lives. Um, so within the work that we do, understand that rights and democracy came into being because of the failure of our ability to pass health care for all in a meaningful way. So health care is at the heart and soul of so many individuals who come into this movement within rights and democracy. So we are absolutely invested in what's going to be happening within this bill. So there is um, an incredible amount of promise. I know that I don't need to continually give you the statistics about the health disparities between different groups within Vermont and the difference that they have and experiences within the healthcare system um, and what those feel like as far as um, being situated within um, social determinants of health, as we call it. Um, what is necessary about this bill is that it is taking um, a really unique turn and having those individuals that are coming from those impacted spaces as the thought leaders, as the experts to determine and to shape a new um, sector of our government that is needed. It is not just those that have a particular technical expertise that is assumed to have um, a wisdom and an inherent historical knowledge of how the current system of our healthcare system, the current system of healthcare delivery is failing so many members of our population. So some of the things that I appreciated that I saw that were updates that I will um, speak to. So I am gonna try to be gentle as I turn my pages, but I have to do so. So um, I saw that there was the update around going as quietly as I can to get to the highlighted spots. Um, so it's moving into the, um, I think out of the findings. No, so within the um, legislative intent and purpose, but um, I found it very interesting, the um, subsection seven on page 11 that was added there to talk about the um, diff definitions of racial categories and identities. Um, I did see the testimony previously from um, UVM where they were speaking about, you know, why are we centering whiteness in this? And I thought that was an important critique. I'm not quite clear, um, and I don't know if, as we're putting it into statute, it might be important to deliver on that promise, how we will achieve the creation of new definitions to better reflect racial and ethnic identities and categories. I'm not even clear who does that, who does that work. Is that coming from the advisory commission? Is that coming from the Office of Health Equity? Is that coming from the legislature? So if we are going to do that, um, recognizing that it does have impacts back to census data, how we're tracking health outcomes, um, that we're still very clear as to what that actually means and who has um, ultimate responsibility for ensuring that that gets done. 
Um, so it might be it might be a helpful thought exercise to name those out. Um, moving towards um, page 13, I appreciated the components there. I know that Senator Rahm has been fighting doggedly to try to ensure that we're thinking about language, um, how we have language translation services and ensuring that that is um, that all communications are appropriate and are accessible to all. So I thought that was an important inclusion that I did appreciate. Um, as I'm looking at the commission itself, um, one of the other pieces that I did like that was changed um, from as it came over to the Senate was the inclusion of a, an end date for when the group will be established. Um, and I know that may feel off, people might wanna have it come closer to a year. What I can tell you is that in even within the work that I'm doing externally in the community and within um, the Just Transition Subcommittee, asking folks that are coming from the most impacted communities to do work on behalf of the state is incredibly exhausting. It is labor intensive. It is grossly undercompensated. And many of these organizations and entities are extremely limited in who they may be able to provide as an opportunity to appoint if it is not a private citizen, then an employee. Um, but um, recognizing that it might take quite a bit more than what we might think of a standard meeting. Well, they're only meeting once or twice a month, but then there's work outside of that work. Um, and as well as the fact that they typically have other job um, duties and responsibilities that they have to carry within their everyday lives. So um, to move at the speed of trust of a group this size, many of whom have never been in the same room together, I think it is appropriate to really give that space so that folks can work in a collaborative fashion um, and make sure that we're not losing anybody in this very long list of voices that's here. So um, while I so that that's ultimately up to the advocates who created this bill, I think, to kind of speak to what they feel about that speed. But just my observations are that moving on these really truncated timeframes that move at the speed of government rather than the speed of trust is making these impacted folks that want to do this work not step into it or to leave it because it proves to be more harmful than helpful to both themselves and the communities that they're representing. So just as a kind of caveat to keep there that I think is important. Um, what I also saw in here, so um, on page 19, um, I wanted to just make a quick note about that. So on page 19, subsection six, where we're talking about the distribution of grants that I assume will either come from um, funds brought from the Department of Health Perhaps it is a set aside that comes from the ARPA funds. I'm not sure how that grant funding will be situated, but um, what I find that's interesting about this and important to consider is um, one of the reasons why this is important for this particular advisory commission to do this rather than just trusting within a particular institution like the Department of Health, for example, is that we don't have that representation in the Department of Health. We do not have this breadth of diversity of voices of those who are both writing, approving, executing, implementing, and determining the success or failures as we like to couch them in one of the two categories for that work being done. This is a unique opportunity to um, ensure that those that are most impacted actually have a voice in determining who gets those funds, how they will be utilized and whether or not it will actually deliver on what is being purported. So um, that is a slight shift. And I, and I think it's an important way to yield power and to recognize the importance of voice within these conversations. Um, let me keep going. I'm trying to be gentle, gentle. So um, some of the other things that I had um, noted, I'm still, there's, um, wait, I don't, it's not highlighted here. Pardon me, I have to go to a different document. When I'm looking at the duties for um, the Office of Racial Equity within there, there's still something that feels slightly discordant to me um, about the way that it's written that um, that office is going to oversee until um, until the Office of Health Equity is established. Um, it reads to me when I'm reading the bill more that they're essentially convening the group, that they're there to convene the group to help support and perhaps maybe the initial infrastructure, but that they're not the, um, that they are not the lead themselves, especially if the group is self-electing a chair. So I don't know, there's just something slightly that it's, it's listed as though they're overseeing this work, 
Um, I, I don't, there's a nuance, I think, in responsibility that I, I would want to see shifted there, I think. Hi, can, um, you, can you point to the page and the, I'm gonna and try the to get you there. know, the language that you're yes. um, specifically concerned about? We, to the right we'll version. put our brains <laughs> to it. I appreciate it. Um, uh, is it, is it my, oh. page 20? Is it under the meetings piece? Um, let me take 20, a look. 21. Anyway, look for it, uh, and uh, you don't have to do that right now, but at least if you could send us a little note. Yes, yes. I do okay. have it listed in a different document, so I may be able to get there fairly okay. quickly. Uh, yeah, don't. Because um, I highlighted in my old version before I saw this one today. Um, okay, so it was right before the report of continuing education area. So uh -huh. It was just this one random sentence that was kind of thrown in there. Well, you know, um, go ahead we'll and, and we'll find it <laughs> and give your, finish your testimony. And then I appreciate that. Uh, well, you can send us a note or we'll call you back in to the room. I appreciate that. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank you. OK, so um, my other pieces then, too. So um, around the continuing education piece, that's a really, really important one. Um, just as a point of information, um, slightly before I made my decision to leave the legislature, literally on one of those really touch point days of my story when we were dealing with the threats that came on the computer, I was literally meeting with the Vermont um, Hospital Association and the Vermont Medical Society to talk about this very thing. And they were trying to initiate um, a whole range of activities, everything from internal surveys to find out where attitudes and beliefs are to starting to implement actual trainings. Um, it's very loosely named, but only in the report section. And so both the commission is, is named as um, advising on this training, but then that advisement comes through the formation of a report, which are two different processes. Um, I don't know what happened to that work. I have no idea what happened to that work and those initiatives that those groups have pushed forth since then. In the same way that we're placing a culpability by directly naming those who are participating in the commission, I would like to see some measure of accountability for those organizations that do have a duty to do this, um, to execute these trainings, that they are collaborating somehow with this, coal with this um, commission, other than just in the um, creation of a report. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is I think we're going right straight back to our initial initial testimony this morning from VPQHC, where they are doing some training in collaboration, or at least in coordination with uh, the Department of Health on um, racial equity mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. uh, practitioners. So mm -hmm. is your suggestion to identify the those folks like the VPQHC and, and, and put some of this into statute so it becomes something that we can provide oversight. I think so. It's a little bit clearer for the commission itself. Who's we've made given them a charge that they're supposed to advise them somehow on this. Um, okay. And so, but where does that relationship begin or end and who are they having the relationship with? Is it just, you know, is this just strictly within the state of Vermont? Are we talking just within state government? Or are we yeah. talking about external groups? So, um, and if those external groups are doing that, this group should have a sense of what the heck they're doing, whether or not it's working, and if these are even the most effective mechanisms for doing that. Um, so this could be a really important opportunity to bring the folks that have a, an interest in creating this work and those who are trying to do this work to get them in better alignment. So um, I wanna be clear about this. So I have the fortune of having one of the few um, African-American primary care physicians in the state of Vermont um, and he's fairly new to Vermont himself and is very interested in wanting to create more training opportunities because he sees a revolving door for health practitioners. I know that was something we dealt with down in um, Bennington County all the time. It was like literally a ticking, oh, how long is that female black doctor gonna stay? Give her about a year. So exactly. he's seeing people leaving and not wanting to stay and wanted to be a part of this. So it is something that um, does have a real urgency to it as well. Um, so, so I would like so, to see a little uh, bit more. I think that. there was some language either in the bill or proposed to the bill and we'll try and circle around and, and look at that because I think you're absolutely right. It makes a whole lot of sense. It, if it's not there, it's not there. It's invisible. So thank you. Um, other than that, I think this is, has incredible promise and I would look forward to 
um, how else this will happen? So if we are creating this health equity, um, um, essentially this office of health equity, what will that rollout be? Um, so once we do the ribbon cutting, how does the community know about what this office is supposed to do and how they will interact with this office? Um, is there anything else further than that um, that we want to see? Because this commission is going to continue after the office is established, but I'm still looking again for that same way we think about a climate plan needs to be understood by the whole state of Vermont. How does this health equity initiative resonate back to the people who called for it to begin with? Um, so I'm not quite sure what would be a great mechanism for that, but it's just an additional thought that I have that might be helpful to name. Okay. Terrific. Anything else? Um, yeah, so I heard a little bit of the conversation around the ARPA funds um, and thinking about that, what is the way that that is. I, I like the way that it was renamed. Um, it wasn't clear in the previous version um, that the commission is looking at specific ways that that will be spent to address the health equity issues happening within impacted communities. Um, but um, so I think that the, the restructuring of that sentence is a little, is better, is better. It could probably even be a little bit tighter again recognizing the scope of work that this commission is going to have to do, which is massive, um, as much specificity as can be given can be very helpful. Um, yes, I think that's all I have, because I believe that we covered most everything else. I apologize. I'm going back to my old notes um, and not looking at the uh, current version, just to make sure I'm not missing anything else that wanted to be brought up. But does anyone have any other questions for me while I surf through <laughs> my chicken I think scratch? we're good. You know, I think if you have, uh, as we, we're going to be going through the bill and, and trying to uh, spruce it up a little bit. So if you have uh, comments, uh, please send them along. But you understand legislative time probably better than most. Mm -hmm. And we are at the end of it. Yes. So. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Well, also, you, you know, also knowing, listen, I, you know, I appreciate uh, the look into the bill that you've taken. We also know that something like this is, this is the beginning and it's, it's going to be improved over time, regardless of what we do today, it, it, mm -hmm. honestly. So thank you. Uh, thank thanks you. For your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the advocates that brought this forth. Much appreciated. Okay. All right. We're good. All right, committee. Uh, Nelly, is um, is Katie available? I think she said she was. So I'm going to suggest committee that we take five minutes of stretch time. We need that, and then we'll have Katie come in. We can go through all the Katie bills with us, including this one. Okay.